Hi, everybody, um, and welcome back. Today, we're going to talk about alibi believability, um, and we're going to uh, dive into pretty deep detail um, on the concept of alibi believability. So hopefully, uh, before you guys um, start this lecture, hopefully you've uh, watched these two um, YouTube videos um, and kind of are familiar enough with the story of um, Ron Cotton, all right? So um, Ron Cotton, uh, here on the left, um, was... Um, accused, falsely convicted of, uh, wrongfully convicted of raping uh, Jennifer Thompson right there, um, the woman next to him. And you saw kind of the tale of their story across those two 60-minute um, segments. And of course, the major issue in this case was not necessarily an alibi on its face. Um, the major issue was an eyewitness misidentification. Specifically, Jennifer Garner, um, not Jennifer Garner, excuse me, Jennifer Thompson, um, misidentified um, Ron Cotton here with Bobby Poole here. And if you look at them together on, on this slide, you can kind of see why in a potentially biased lineup or even in an unbiased lineup, how this um, misidentification could have happened, right? They kind of both have similar eyes. Their eyebrows are kind of further apart from each other. They have wide set noses, kind of puffier lips, right? And so there are some striking similarities between these two men, even though they are unrelated to each other. But that's not... Um, the kind of variable of interest from an alibi perspective that we should be looking at, right? So the main issue uh, from an alibi perspective is that Mr. Cotton's initial alibi was that he was with his brother and some friends, went to a bar, and got dropped off at home, right? He, he was like, what night was that? Oh, I think that's what I was doing. After being arrested, his mom said, no, 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 that, you did that on Saturday. The date they asked you about was Friday. And his mother reminded him that he mixed up weekends, and he was really home, at home sleeping on the couch, right? So while the issues of eyewitnesses were present and racism was, um, was present in this case, why wasn't Mr. Cotton's alibi believed? And we're going to talk about that in, um, in detail going forward. So alibi about, uh, alibis are evaluated by several different triers of fact. Police, attorneys, judges, jurors, right? All of these evaluators believe the alibi, if they believe the alibi claim, the defendant could be exonerated, right? If they don't believe the alibi claim, there's strong potential for a conviction. And that kind of makes sense, right? If the police believe it, they're not going to, tr to arrest you. If attorneys believe it, they're not going to charge you. If judges believe it, they'll throw the case out. If juries believe it, they'll find you not guilty, right? If they don't believe it, though, the police are going to arrest you. If the attorneys don't believe it, they're going to charge you. If the judges don't believe it, they're going to allow the case to go forward. If the jurors don't believe it, they're going to convict you, right? So there's major factors that affect um, alibi believability here. Supporting evidence, the consistency or inconsistency of the claim, and contextual issues like defendant characteristics, salaciousness of the alibi, etc. Right? We're going to go into all of these in more detail, but all of these affect alibi believability. So we know from the taxonomy that a corroborator's relationship to the suspect can affect believability, right? We know that friends versus strangers, right? Friends are less believable than strangers are. In fact, in some contexts, um, it's even suggested that it's better to have no corroborator at all rather than a close friend or, or a relative. Jurors, law enforcement officers, and mock law enforcement officers were all skeptical of corroborators that were relatives. In one study of defense attorneys, even, the suggestion was made that... Um, if someone said, no, 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 I've got a strong alibi, I was with my wife, or I was with my mother, the defense attorney said, I don't ever call them, they always lie, they're always willing to lie, I'm not I'm going to waste my time investigating an alibi if a mom or a girlfriend is involved. The number of corroborators and the corroborator relationship with the suspect were the two biggest predictors to law enforcement believability, right? Although not absolute um, predictors. So the corroborator age also um, might matter, right? So for example, children are viewed as uh, more positively than adults, even though this is counter to the eyewitness literature, right? Uh, children eyewitnesses are viewed as very skeptical um, because they might make mistakes and they just kind of agree with whatever's being told to them. However, children alibis, it's believed they don't have any real motivation to lie and therefore they are um, stronger, more believable witnesses. Um, more confident corroborators were also viewed more strongly than less confident corroborators, which is similar to eyewitness research, where that confident um, accuracy relationship, even though it's not strong in reality, it's believed to be very, very strong. So physical evidence is more important than person evidence when it comes to alibi believability, as we've discussed before. And specifically, law enforcement officers stated that the most believable alibi evidence was that the suspect was in jail or prison, 
followed by close uh, circuit television uh, footage and cell phone records, right? So to law enforcement, the thing that makes the most sense to them is you can't commit a crime outside of prison if you are currently in prison. Therefore, we believe you didn't do it. Next to that is we see on video and next to that is cell phone rec records. Physical evidence was also viewed as significantly more believable than even the strongest person evidence, even when that physical evidence is weak. And so what is very important about this is that physical evidence matters a lot, right? So, and that's also important for you if you ever need an alibi one day to, to think about is find as much physical evidence as, as you can because that's going to be significantly more believable than any sort of person evidence. So with uh, physical evidence, perception of the alibi increases and an increase in the perception of the alibi leads to an increase in perception of the defendant and therefore more certainty in jurors' verdicts. So physical evidence and providing physical evidence led to viewing the defendant as more intelligent, more honest, more likable, and therefore less likely to be guilty, and therefore more confidence in jurors' verdicts, right? The problem with this, though, is physical evidence is often really difficult to obtain. If you guys are anything at all, like I am, right? I go out to eat with my wife, I pay the bill, I take the receipt, crumple it up, put it in my pocket, then typically go home, throw it on the counter, my wife yells at me for leaving trash on the counter, and then it goes straight to the waste bucket, right? That's kind of the order of events. Uh, for going out to eat with my wife. If I needed uh, uh, physical evidence of where I was for dinner that night, even five days later, I'm not going to have it because I've already thrown it out, right? And so um, the idea that you know physical evidence is important is, is good. We need to know that. But in reality, what kind of physical evidence will you have of your alibi? And by the way, not to mention that that physical evidence of a, a receipt isn't necessarily super compelling depending on the details on the receipt also. Um, alibi consistency, though, also matters. So while evidence matters, another important consideration is this consistency, and there are several reasons a memory might change, right? Number one, it could be a memory issue, right? You may have just forgotten where you were. Uh, it could be a purposeful lie, right? However, there's skepticism that is always surrounding inconsistent alibis. As soon as you tell someone a story and then say, wait a minute, that might not be true, maybe I was there, you are automatically viewed with more skepticism. When asked, 80% of police stated that the reason an alibi may change is due to the suspect lying. And so the number one thought is, from law enforcement at least, is the suspect is not being honest with us and that's why they changed the alibi. When they at, were asked, when specifically police were asked, can you consider other reasons? Not that they're lying. What's the second reason why you think they might change your alibi? It's alcohol and drug uh, related. They must have been taking some sort of supplements because people would just remember where they are. We already know, though, that that's not true, right? We know that memory isn't that great. Yet, for some reason, still, that has not kind of translated into law enforcement circles that people just have a hard time coming up with where they were on a fairly innocuous evening, sometimes weeks or months ago. In one study, suspects claimed to lie or to misremember uh, an event, right? In the lie condition, they stated they lied due to being with their mistress, right? In the misremember condition, they were told that they were with their cousin. So in this research study, we said to um, suspects in front of participants, we want you to either lie or misremember the event. When the participant finds out that you lied, you have to admit either, well, of course I lied, I was with my mistress and I don't want anyone to know about that, or to say, oh, yeah, you're right, no, I just misremembered. I was a different weekend, you're right, I was with my cousin that weekend. Interestingly, though, admitting to the affair was viewed as a legitimate reason to lie, and therefore suspects were viewed with less suspicion. Even though a mistress is what kind of person evidence? Presumably a motivated familiar other. So if, if you're caught in a lie with alibis, there could be, and there needs to be more research to, to determine this, but there could actually be some cases where lying actually strengthens your alibi because... You're saying stuff like, I was cheating on my wife and I don't want my wife and kids to know about it, right? That this is not in any way trying to condone infidelity, but it just suddenly makes an alibi more believable. Um, as far as lie detection, um, and we know, and this is you know kind of outside the scope of this class, but we have to kind of bring it up in this context. Humans are pretty bad at detecting lies. Um, one study suggests that folks can detect deceptive alibis quite well if they use a verifiability approach, which is basically looking for checkable versus uncheckable details. 
so the idea is if you, if you were to ask someone, where were you last night? And someone said, even if they talked about it in great detail, so that they were at home reading a book, right? Well, you can't really verify any of that information, right? Whereas if someone said, well, I went to this restaurant and I know they have security camera footage. And then from there, I went to the movies. Here's my ticket stub. And then from there, and they could verify where they were with checkable details. That checkability uh, factor or verifiability approach actually made people pretty good at determining weak versus false alibis, right? However, most participants still looked for consistency in those alibis, right? So inconsistent alibis um, are still believed to be the leading cause of skepticism for suspects. But there's also a problem with this verifiability approach, right? What happens if genuinely... Last night, all I was doing was sitting at home and reading a book. I'm actually in the middle of a John Grisham book right now, and I spent several hours last night just sitting on my couch reading the book. How can I verify that? I can't. So now suddenly, if we use this verifiability approach, is there potential that I'm going to be viewed with skepticism? There are several contextual factors that can help alibi uh, believability, and we'll go into all of these in uh, more detail, so I'll kind of fly through these pretty quickly. Um, but they're incriminating evidence, the order of evidence collection, salaciousness, timing of alibi disclosure, type of alibi, defendant characteristics, and juror motivation. So as far as incriminating evidence is concerned, a lot of studies examine alibis as the only piece of evidence, but that's not really how a trial works, right? And this is one of those issues that we talked about in that tension between psychology and law that the law gets kind of excited with psychology about is they say, well, you did a whole study where there was only one piece of evidence presented. That's not how a trial, there's typical multiple pieces of evidence and that evidence is often in conflict with each other. So most studies examining multiple pieces of evidence used um, eyewitnesses as the prosecution defense. And so... The only other evidence presented was eyewitnesses. Again, possibly not the best design, but better than not having prosecution evidence. Those studies that only used prosecution evidence found the type of alibi corroborator affected the other evidence. And this theme was consistent with DNA evidence too. And so basically, if the alibi corroborator was a motivated, familiar other, that wasn't possibly, uh, may, it didn't make the alibi seem as believable and therefore the other evidence was viewed stronger. If the alibi was a stranger, the other evidence was viewed with more skepticism and the alibi seemed a little bit stronger, right? And so the the idea that evidence is interacting with other pieces of evidence to paint the full picture is actually really, really important in wrongful conviction work and it's something that we need more of with this conflicting kind of evidence. Um, there's investigator factors, right? In order, uh, the order in which the evidence um, is collected can also, uh, that should say is collected. I don't know where that, the order in which evidence can also, right? The order in which evidence is collected can also affect believability, right? Um, sometimes the very first piece of evidence you collect colors the whole investigation, right? If we decide an eyewitness said that's your guy, that might color the whole investigation. There's also this idea of recency where the evidence that's collected the most recently is the most believed, right? And so investigator expectations play a role here. If investigators are expecting an alibi to be true, they may believe it, right? Jurors, on the other hand, as triers of fact, viewed alibis as less believable when present only at a trial. So let's say in an empirical study, we said, okay, the suspect told their alibi to the cops, the cops didn't believe it, so... um, They're presenting it again here for you, the jury, to try and determine if you think it's true or not. Versus, the suspect never told the cops about it, they're only telling you the jury. They viewed it as less believable when they only told the jury. The timing of disclosure also affected defendant characteristics such that defendants were viewed as more trustworthy and confident when they disclosed their alibi early. This, of course, will be a problem we'll examine later, but this also kind of, uh, to some extent, makes sense, right? The earlier you disclose your alibi from a trial strategy standpoint, and again, I don't want to get into it too much here because we're going to talk about it um, in a future lecture, but it gives the prosecution more time to pick apart the alibi, right? However, if you can disclose an alibi early enough that is solid, then maybe it will keep you from getting charged. So here's this thing you kind of have to weigh out is, do I give them a lot of time to investigate it and possibly find that I'm wrong? And we know what happens if you're wrong, you're not going to be very well believed. Or do I not give them time to investigate it, but then I am viewed with more skepticism by the jury? As we've already kind of talked about, um, salaciousness um, is something that is a factor. However, the research is somewhat mixed on the type of salaciousness. 
For example, if a suspect who claims to be doing drugs or some other illegal activity was viewed as less believable and had lower character traits, right? So if you were to say, no, 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 I didn't commit that murder because I was selling drugs on the other side of town, it's like, okay, well, you're just a sleazy person and now I don't believe you at all, right? However, some studies have suggested that certain behaviors like watching porn, cheating on your spouse, illegally downloading movies could actually increase alibi believability because it's something that is kind of embarrassing that you don't necessarily want to admit, especially to law enforcement. So more research is needed on the type of salaciousness and its effect on alibi believability. And that, to some extent, makes sense, right? These, these kind of um, activities here are obviously very different than committing crimes. And so the kind of concept in general of um, the type of salaciousness makes a whole lot of sense. So crime seriousness could also affect believability. Some studies have found that um, the more serious the crime caused the alibis to belie be believed less. Although it's not true across studies, so more research is needed, but the basic idea is if it's a very serious crime, the police are throwing many more resources at investigating that crime, so if they think you're the suspect, they've probably done a thorough investigation of that, and therefore we're not going to trust your alibi. However, what suspects need their alibi to be believed more? Those accused of a more or less serious crime. If I'm accused of jaywalking and my alibi isn't believed, okay, big deal, I'm going to get a ticket, right? If I'm accused of a rape or a murder, that's way worse, right? I'm going to go to prison for way longer, if not even possibly get sentenced to death. And so I really need my alibi to be believed. But because of the seriousness of the crime, it's just not going to be as much. So there are some defendant characteristics and juror motivation that also matter. So there's gender stereotype consistent versus gender stereotype inconsistent alibis that could affect guilt ratings. So for example, um, a study uh, kind of um, manipulated whether it was a man or a woman who was either shopping for tools or for salon products. And what they found was that those kind of gender consistent uh, stereotypes um, more or less uh, led to more believability than gender inconsistent stereotypes. A defendant race also matters, such that black defendants' alibis are scrutinized more than white defendants' alibis. However, there's only been one study on this, and so that obviously needs more research. And then past conv convictions could also affect believability. If the defendant had committed a similar crime in the past versus committed a different crime in the past, if there was a similar crime, then there's suggestions of a pattern, and then that's why they tend to believe um, that alibi less. Going back to Ron Cotton, Ron Cotton was, and obviously still is, a black man with a history of dating white girls, right? This really, really pissed off one of the police officers working his case. They, he was a white guy who thought white girls should be with white guys and just did not like the fact that Ron Cotton dated white women. Cotton also had a past criminal record, and it, the fact pattern was somewhat similar to what happened with Jennifer Thompson. So when he was 16, he broke into a friend's house to fool around with his friend's sister, right? Which is obviously a huge violation, as we know, of bro code. You should not do that with your friend's sister, right? But maybe bro code didn't exist back then. So when he broke into, like, fool around with her and stuff, she got startled and screamed, causing her mother to enter the room with a shotgun. Cotton was arrested and went to prison for 18 months for breaking and entering because, of course, um, his friend's mother thought that he was doing something very, very sketchy. Jennifer Thompson was actually told of Cotton's past crimes, how he liked white girls, and had raped a 14-year-old white girl before. And so all of this led to Jennifer Thompson being more confident in him and also people not believing his alibi, which had already changed, because this was a pattern of crime that he had committed in the past. He just didn't get away with it because the girl screamed and mom came in with a shotgun, presumably, right? Which, of course, we've found out is not true in the sense that Jennifer Thompson was not at any point raped by Ron Cotton. So some issues in future directions here for um, alibi believability research, right? Most studies use mock jurors or mock investigators. This is asking lay participants to take on the role of a job, right? So in social science research, we'll sometimes do this. Pretend you're the police, pretend you're a lawyer, pretend you're a juror, because it's too complicated, too expensive to study real jurors, real police, real lawyers, right? But there's some issues that arise in doing this. Do any of us, even as criminology students possibly, do any of us have the training of a seasoned police detective? Of course not, right? And so that's, we're asking people to do kind of difficult jobs. Another one is that most participants are white. And there's nothing inherently wrong with being white, obviously. 
Um, and, and I'm not advocating that, you know, we shouldn't listen to what white people have to say or anything. But the problem is, if we only have one cultural perspective on what are reasonable alibis and unreasonable alibis, we're missing out a tremendous amount of knowledge, right? We've already talked about in previous lectures how um, Hispanic participants suggested that they hung out with family more and white participants suggested they hung out with friends more than other groups, right? So there's already, we see this kind of cultural difference present there, right? By only having white participants, we might actually be missing out on some cultural sensitivity that we need to understand what is a reasonable alibi versus a non-reasonable alibi, right? Most studies also use written vignettes that are relatively short, 300 to 500 words. This is also a problem that social science research gets kind of pegged with because a real trial might take the place over the course of a week. It might take a couple days. It might have 10,000 pages of trial transcripts. And we want you to understand what happened in a trial in 500 words. And 500 words, I believe, is one Microsoft Word page, single spaced, maybe two. And so that's not a tremendous amount of space to cover a whole trial, right? And so there are some sort of, there's problems with using written vignettes. However, by having more complicated research designs, it's significantly more expensive. And when you're a researcher, you have to figure out ways to do research within the confines of your, the limitations of your resources, right? If I don't have a $150,000 grant, I can't go out and hire attorneys, so I'll use mock attorneys. If, if I don't have unlimited time, I can't do in-depth interviews with people because I've got other responsibilities, right? And so there's ways that people basically try and... Um, I don't even call it cut corners because that's not an accurate way to state it, but make compromises in order to still actually do good quality research that might have some validity problems to it, or ecological validity problems at least. So as always, that's, um, that's all I have for you today. If you all have any questions, please just drop them down below, um, and I will talk to you guys soon.